continue, continuing our consideration of forgiveness, forgiveness which is so essential uh, in the Bible, the gospel story, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the redemptive power of Jesus. And we find that forgiveness is a theme that runs all the way through the Bible. And like it's, a, it's an essential element of the whole story of, of the Bible is this search need for forgiveness and what happens when there is no forgiveness, not just forgiveness uh, of God so that we are separated from God by unforgiveness, by sin, uh, and uh, how it separates us from one another with the destructive power of unforgiveness and anger. I want to go back and we're going to look at the foundation, the first book of the Bible. We say Genesis, Genesis being the origin, the source of everything else, everything's going to flow out of Genesis. And the themes, uh, they're going to be picked up through the rest of the scriptures and all the other books, um, are um, presented to us in the book of Genesis. Those are all, they come forth in that book, and then they're kind of presented and they played out the rest of the Bible. Remember that Genesis is a book. It's not just chapter one of the Bible. It's a book, and like any book, uh, it has a beginning and an end. It has a theme, it has a plot, it has character development. And all those things. And so I want to just look at uh, Genesis. And so what is the, um, the story of Genesis? If you just take Genesis as a book unto itself, like take it out of the Bible and just leave it as a book and try to find its theme and its, um, its character, its nature. What, what is it trying to teach us? What trying to show us? Uh, the kind of insight that I got here way back was when uh, doing some studies, the most common word in the book of Genesis, that's repeated more than any other word, is the word conflict, struggle, contention. You know, there's this kind of tension between people um, and relationships and with God. So it's this conflict. And that's kind of played out in the book of Genesis. And I think that's, I realize that's an important word because that that is sort of the, the groundwork that's going to uh, categorize everything else that happens in the scriptures. But where's the conflict? Well, you see it in Genesis. It's like generation to generation. It's just conflict after conflict. When you want to start with, um, with the first story that everybody knows after they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, uh, and they try to make it in the, in the, uh, the wilderness there, um, away from God, away from Eden, away from paradise, uh, the first story that you have is Cain and Abel. And uh, Cain kills Abel. There's some strife between them, some conflict between them. Uh, and the question is now going to be, for the rest of the book, how do you resolve conflict? So we've got conflict between people. It seems to be natural. It seems to be just part of the story. How does it get resolved? Well, the very first uh, story that we have of conflict is resolved by Cain killing Abel. And you know that from that point on, they never argued again. There was Cain wins, Abel loses. Uh, and we have a resolution. It's a, not a good one. Uh, it's not one that we want to replicate. But that is how Genesis presents the story. Conflict and conflict resolution in destruction and death. Not good. Then you go a, little, go a little further into the story when we get into Abraham. So you have Abraham. And he's introduced to his cousin Lot. And Abraham and Lot uh, are very prosperous. Uh, they have their flocks. And their, their, uh, their tribes are kind of living in the, in the wilderness as nomads do. Um, but this conflict then arises between Lot and Abraham. Lot's workers and Abraham's workers. And uh, there's a real conflict going on. And Abraham and Lot have to get together and say, okay, what are we going to do? This is not working out. Uh, we're trying to um, maintain our flocks and our, our, uh, our livelihood here. And we're not getting along. We're in constant conflict. So what's going to happen? Then Abraham presents a solution. We have another solution. We have Cain and Abel had a solution, not a very good one. Um, just killed one of them and no more conflict. But what Abraham is going to do is he says, well, let's separate. If you go north, I'll go south. If you go east, I'll go west. He says, you choose wherever you want to go, and I'll um, take the rest. So Lot chooses uh, to go off, and he settles the land, which becomes later famous Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and, but they're separated. So there's another conflict resolution. We separate. 
we, we go our separate ways. We don't um, relate to one another anymore. So off you go. So there's some conflict. And then as you go further in the story, we have um, Abraham's wife, Sarah. And there's a slave girl, Hagar. And you read how they don't get along. They, uh, uh, Hagar is very poorly treated by Sarah, to the point where she's in tears. And eventually, uh, Hagar will be sent away. You know, just get out of the camp. Get out, get out of here because you're a you're source of conflict and we can't get along. And the, and the source of that, the deeper story, is that they each had a son. You have Abraham uh, had uh, Isaac and uh, through Sarah, and he had uh, Ishmael through Hagar. And the two boys don't get along. You find out that they're, they're hurting each other. Ishmael's older. And uh, Sarah comes across a scene where Ishmael is uh, beating up on Isaac. He's abusing him in some way. And um, she complains to Abraham. And the conflict resolution comes to four again by taking Hagar and Ishmael and throwing them out of the camp. You know, separation again. Distance. Go away. We don't want you. We can't, we can't live together. We can't work together. This isn't working out. Um, so you have Abraham and Lot, you have um, Sarah and Hagar, you have Ishmael and Isaac, and you go forward in the story. Then you have Jacob and Esau. They're fighting with each other in the mother's womb. Um, there's a conflict. Uh, when Rebecca says um, that if the two children are fighting within my womb, they're going to be the death of me. Uh, and they're born, and there's a good struggle as they're born. It's, just, it's kind of, I don't know, humorous or not, but um, they're twins, and um, one starts to come out, and that's Jacob, and uh, the other one, Esau, pulls him back. But the midwife had tied a string on the hand of the one who got first, Jacob, to see which one was going to be the first. But in the struggle, um, Esau is actually born first, but um, Jacob actually emerge first. It's kind of confusing there, but um, Jacob is the firstborn, and he has a conflict with Esau at the point where they have to uh, separate, and off Jacob goes, and it's the same sort of conflict resolution. He's going to go off to a far land. He goes and he finds his uh, relatives in, in a distant land, and he joins up with Laban, who would be a cousin or something, and in that he meets Laban's daughters, and um, you have uh, the story there of now we have Rachel entering the picture. He's very much in love with Rachel, but there's a sister, Leah. And you know that between Leah and Rachel, the two sisters, there's going to be conflict. And uh, there's a point of argument in the end. Uh, Jacob marries both of them. Uh, Rachel f f had to wait until he married Leah. And then he has both of them, and there's a conflict going on there. Eventually, as it's almost like you read it, it's going to come. You could guess that Laban and Jacob will start to enter into conflict. And it's the same sort of conflict resolution. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to tell, or, or Jacob is going to pack up and leave. They have to separate. They have to go their separate ways. They can't get along. They can't make it work. Um, so Jacob is going to take his, his, wife, his wives, his family, and his flocks. He's going to go to a distant land. And so off he goes. So you, you've lost uh, another uh, family unity in all this. And Jacob is going to settle down eventually, and he has um, with Rachel and Leah. He has all the children. They're the 12 tribes of Israel, They're the sons of Jacob. Um, and so you got all these sons are being born. And the last, not the last, but almost the last, the second last, was, was Joseph. Uh, Joseph is the key figure in... Um, the Genesis story. About one third of the whole book of Genesis is devoted to telling you the story of Joseph. So there's something obviously very important here. Back in the early church, uh, all the fathers of the church, whether it's Jerome or Augustine or Cyprian or um, Origen, they all wrote about jo the Joseph story. They were fascinated with this Joseph story. They saw the Joseph story as sort of a key to unlocking some of the mystery of the Bible and uh, the ministry of Jesus, where Joseph was a precursor to Jesus. He was sort of a pre-image. He's the one who's going to foreshadow uh, Jesus, and he does that in many ways. But let's go back to, to Joseph and his story. Uh, he's born, seemingly very gifted. Um, he has the dreams. 
and he tells his father about the dreams, and they're not going to be well received by the brothers because the dream is that he is going to be in the center and the brothers are going to bow down to him and not worship him, but honor him, obey him, and he's going to be the, the, um, the center. And they're going to be centered on him. So that doesn't sit very well with the rest of them. And then he has the other one where it's the stars. They're uh, the sky, and even the sun and the moon are going to honor him. The sun and the moon is father and mother. Uh, and the brothers are really upset about that. So then, so there's a lot of jealousy going on, a lot of anger, a lot of, a lot of uh, division. Uh, and some of it, if you want to really read into the story, Joseph was the favorite son. You know, the story, he got, he got the coat of many colors, which was a, a designation that he was going to be the heir apparent. You had the, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, who's going to be the next patriarch? You've got 12 sons. Which one's going to take it over? Uh, Reuben would be the oldest, so he should be the designated heir. But in fact, the father, Jacob, chooses Joseph. That's why he gets the coat of many colors. And that is um, kind of angers the other brothers. We've got more jealousy coming in here to the point where they're going to um, yeah, you're going to try to kill him. In the story, and it's it read, read between the lines, you have uh, the brothers are out in the fields with the flocks. The father says to Joseph, the, the boys have been gone for quite a while. I want to send them some food. Would you pack up some food and go out and meet them and bring them some food for us and see how things are going and come back and report to me. What you see in the story is the brothers are all out in the fields with the flocks. Who's not out in the field with the flocks? It's Joseph. He's home. Uh, and he didn't have to work or he didn't have to... Um, do the same sort of toil that the others did. It all feeds into that envy and the jealousy. Why he didn't work is probably because he was the, uh, the heir apparent. He was the, the little prince. Then um, he had the coat of many colors. Those coats that have been in the Middle East, when you wear one of those long robes, one of the very first things, you can't work. You're, you're kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of uh, limiting you in your activity. You know, just dragging around a coat and you're in the hot sun and you're out with the flocks. First thing you do is take the coat off. So, so Joseph, anyway, is home. He sent out to the fields to find the brothers, and out he goes. And eventually he'll find the brothers. And uh, when they see him coming, all that jealousy and their praise and anger comes to the surface. They say, let's kill him. Uh, let's kill this man. And let's see what becomes of his dreams then. So they, they decide to kill him. There's a little uh, dialogue, conflict between the brothers where instead of killing him and getting blood on their hands, they decide just to throw him into the pit uh, and let him die on his own so they don't get blood on their hands. Um, later, they, there's a, uh, the traders, the Israel traders come, and they end up selling Joseph. And this is the first you see of him imaging or foreshadowing Jesus because he's sold uh, for 20 pieces of silver. He's betrayed by his brothers for 20 pieces of silver. Um, and as Jesus would be himself, sold for 30 pieces of silver. So he's um, he's sold into slavery. He goes down to Egypt. Um, he's a very intelligent young man. He ends up working uh, at House of Forfear. A, a very um, astute young man. He climbs the ladder, and he ends up becoming the, uh, the master of the house. He's the one who's overseeing uh, all the work of the house and the finances of the house and the good keep, upkeep of the house. He's in a position of high responsibility, where the prophet says to him, uh, you have the run of this house. You have anything but my wife. You take everything you want. Uh, I just trust you that much. But the uh, the daughter, I mean, not his daughter, but his wife, his wife, um, is kind of fallen in love with Joseph and tries to seduce him. But Joseph rebuffs her. And um, the wife doesn't like being rejected or rebuffed. So she says that uh, Joseph had raped her, and Joseph is then put into prison. Now, in prison, he has the same as his giftedness of his, rises to the surface, and he ends up actually running the whole prison. He's the, the master down there, taking care of everything. Um, the, uh, it comes to the attention of the, the, the chief jailer, and they put all kinds of trust in Joseph. Uh, then there's the, the scene where Two of the prisoners have um, dreams, uh, and they don't know what to make of the dreams. 
but Joseph comes in and he interprets the dreams for them, and the uh, interpretation comes true. Uh, there was the um, the baker, the, he was the Pharaoh's baker, had a dream where he was carrying bread and the birds were trying to steal the bread. Uh, the other prisoner was the, the cupbearer, the wine person to the Pharaoh, and in his dream he was carrying grapes and the birds tried to uh, steal the grapes. Um, and they don't know what to make of all this, and it was a very real dream, it just seemed so real, and Joseph interprets it. And for the one, the baker, who saw the bread, and the bread's trying to steal the bread, Joseph says, well, it's an obvious answer. It says, says um, Pharaoh's going to have your head. You're going to die. You're going to be executed. Uh, and then the, the cupbearer says, oh, my gosh, what about me? And um, Joseph says, no. It says, you will be restored to your service. You will be found innocent. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the predictions or the, the interpretation came true. Um, when you look at the story, it's kind of interesting that you had two people, uh, the bread baker, one, and then the wine steward. Um, it's a foreshadowing of the Eucharist. You have the bread and the wine. And the man with the wine, which will become the blood of, in, in the image of the, the whole gospel, will become the blood of Jesus. He's saved. He's saved from death and restored to service. He's, he's saved by the blood of Jesus. Uh, the the one, the baker man, he was executed because the body of Christ represents the death of Christ. Right? So you have the death of Christ and the suffering of Christ in the Eucharist um, replicated in the death of this baker guy. And you had the, um, the forgiveness of sin in the blood of Jesus replicated in the, the wine store. So when the wine store is restored to service, down the road, there's a pharaoh has a dream, doesn't know what to do with the dream, very disturbed, and um, that's when um, the wine steward says, you know, you have a man down in the prison. He's very good at interpreting dreams. You should get him. So Pharaoh sends for him. It's Joseph. He comes up. He interprets the dream, and that's the dream that we all know. It's the seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, and Joseph says what you're supposed to do is during the years of plenty is you save up the grain, and then in the years of famine, you'll have enough to get you through. And the Pharaoh is very impressed with that, puts Joseph in charge of uh, collecting all this the, the wheat and grain, storing it up against the coming famine. Um, and Joseph does a very, very good job at that. They have tons and tons of grain and wheat stored up. And then when the famine hits, Joseph is in charge now of distributing the grain. And because the famine was widespread, uh, people came from far distant lands to buy food from Egypt. And Joseph was in charge of that. In the story, the brothers up in Cana, they are experiencing the results of this famine. They're in bad straits. Um, they said, and they said, the father, we're not going to survive. We, we just don't have the, the food's not here. We can't feed the flocks. We, we can't uh, we can't make it. But it says, you know, there is rumors that down in Egypt they're giving out and they're selling grain. Let's go down to Egypt, and we'll buy some grain and we'll get get back here. We'll be we'll be okay. We can get through this famine. So the brothers take it on themselves to go down to Egypt to buy grain. They go in to Joseph, um, who's in charge of this whole thing, and Joseph recognizes them right away. He knows these are his brothers, and they're speaking at the language of Cana. They're speaking Arabic, or whatever, Aramaic, whatever the form it was. And Joseph could understand them, but he doesn't let on. He doesn't let them know that it's, he recognizes them, and they don't recognize him. He's speaking in Egyptian. He looks like an Egyptian. He's obviously changed. It's uh, some years later. He's grown up. Uh, he's matured, and he's dressed like an Egyptian. So the brothers don't recognize him, but he recognizes the brothers. And the first thing of Joseph, uh, when you follow the story, is sort of um, it's kind of an anger. It's like a catharsis. All the um, the memories of what the brothers had done to him came back, and uh, he wept. He really, he wept and he cried. And the, the crying was sort of the, uh, the memory just flooding him. And his first thing was to put the brothers in prison. He said, you guys came here and you're just spying on us. So I want you put in prison. And the brothers beg him, no, no, don't do that. We're not spies. No. Okay. He says, uh, he kind of softens. He says, you can go back to your father, but you have to keep one person here, Simon. 
is going to be put in prison. He's a hostage. And until you come back, uh, Simon stays with me. But when you come back, you bring, um, he says, you tell me you have another brother, which is Benjamin, which would have been the closest. He's the actually only one who's a full brother to, uh, to Joseph, same father, same mother, what of Rachel. Is you bring this young man back to me that you claim you have, and then I'll believe your story. So the, the brothers they have the they have the wheat, they have the grain, they go home. Uh, the father is very distraught. Poor Jacob. He says, "I I lost Joseph, and now I've lost Simon. Uh, I don't want to. I don't like this. Um, this. This hurts a lot. I can't lose another son." Uh, so he won't let them go back to Egypt. And there's a long story. And then eventually. This, the famine is so bad, the brothers say to the father, look, we're all dying here. We, we can't, um, can't continue. We have to do what that man in Egypt told us to do and bring, um, uh, bring Benjamin with us so he can see that there is another brother and that our story was true. So Jacob reluctantly lets them go uh, with a lot of tears and saying, boy, if I ever lose, if I lose Benjamin, I've lost it all. So down they go back to Egypt. Joseph sees them. Benjamin's there now. Um, when he sees Benjamin, he cries. And I, I think in my own heart, he's weeping because he realizes God has heard his prayer. This prayer of his heart that it just seemed to be so impossible to ever get answered that he would be reunited you know, with his family and with his brother, Benjamin, who he loved very much. Um, and now here it is right before him. He's, um, he, he weeps. And uh, that's where he turns to the brothers. And he says, it is I, it is Joseph, your brother. And the brothers are absolutely dumbfounded. They're just totally bowled over. Uh, they recognize him. He's talking to them now in Hebrew or Arabic, whatever language. Um, and they realize that it is Joseph. And their first thing, and this is the power of guilt. Guilt is a very important emotion. The first thing they said was, oh, my God, he's going to get back at us. He's going to kill us because of what we did to him. This is payback time. This is revenge time. So they're, they're really, really upset, scared. And then Joseph says, no, he knows what they're thinking, what they're saying. He says, no, I do not seek revenge. Um, I forgive you. I forgive you what you did for me. I forgive you because what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God had a plan. And God's plan is bigger than the evil and the craziness of people's hearts. I forgive you. And it's the first time in the Bible that those words are used. I forgive you. It's Joseph speaking to the brothers. And then you've got the result of that. What's the, what's the first fruit of forgiveness? Well, what you saw previously was always death and separation. You know, Cain kills Abel. Um, Agar is thrown out of the camp. Uh, Jacob runs away. There's always this separation going on when there's unforgiveness. But now... Joseph speaks for forgiveness, and he says, now, go back to Canaan and get my father and your families, and everyone come down here to Egypt, and we can all be together. So if the fruit of unforgiveness is disunity and division, the fruit of forgiveness is going to be um, unity and love and, and peace and family. So... In, in the end, it, 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 you get the long story, you have to go read the book of Genesis. They do come down. Um, Jacob comes down with them, an old man. Joseph sees his father. He's got Benjamin now as a father. The family's back together. It said that Joseph really, really wept. He wept for a long, long time. Uh, it was all coming out. He was uh, just blessed. And the only word is blessing. And he's the one who brought forgiveness. Now, when you read the stories, there are three major scenes where Joseph does the, I forgive you. Do not hold this against yourself. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We go with the will of God. God has blessed us through this, even though it was terrible and evil what you did, but God meant it uh, for the blessing, uh, for blessing all of us, and we are blessed. So let us rejoice and thank God for what he's done, even through the craziness and the sinfulness of men, and the evilness in their hearts. God is greater. So he, he makes these little speeches, which are very, very important to understand how forgiveness works and the blessing that forgiveness is and how you make a decision to forgive. And Joseph did that. The brothers still struggle with this, can they accept the forgiveness? They always, they never, 
respond to it. It's kind of interesting. Joseph does the forgiveness, and then life goes on. Um, eventually, Jacob gets old. It was years later, and he, he dies. And then the brothers say uh, to themselves that the only reason why Joseph didn't kill us or retaliate, take revenge, was because he didn't want to upset our father. That our father was sort of the, 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 uh, the hand holding back Joseph from doing his revenge. But now our father's dead. There's nothing to hold Joseph back anymore. He's going to destroy us. He's going to kill us. He's going to take his revenge. And so they go to Joseph and they have this scene. And this is how the book of Genesis ends. Go to the last chapter, the last paragraphs, is the brothers going to Joseph. And they say to him, Joseph, what we did to you was wrong. We are sorry. Please forgive us. Through this whole story, the brothers had never asked forgiveness. They never said they were sorry. They never said they made a mistake. They, you know, it was Joseph unilaterally forgiving them, reaching out the hand of friendship, and bringing forgiveness to them. But they themselves never asked for it. So you have the second kind of dimension to forgiveness now where there's reconciliation. Forgiveness only takes one person. I forgive from my heart. I choose to forgive. It's my decision to forgive. It's me, and me alone, who makes this decision. But now uh, we have reconciliation. There's two sides. The brothers are asking forgiveness, receiving forgiveness. They're apologizing. They're sorry. Um, now, the, the lesson is this. If Joseph had waited for them to apologize and ask forgiveness, he would have waited for years and years and years, I mean, 30-something years before this ever happened. Um, but reconciliation is the fruit of forgiveness. It comes and then they all weep together. Um, and it says that Joseph wept for a long, long time because he had finally heard the words that he yearned to hear, waited to hear, wanted to hear, and never heard. We're sorry. What we did was wrong. Please forgive us. And so, of course, at the end, he does forgive them. And that's how the book of Genesis ends, with forgiveness and reconciliation. So you start out with conflict and seeking a resolution to this conflict, which is always death or separation. Uh, and then we finally end with forgiveness and reconciliation and unity and love. And that sort of sets the stage. That's the foundation upon which the gospel will be built. Joseph is a forerunner. He's a, he's a foreshadowing of Jesus and his ministry, who brought peace, reconciliation, and the forgiveness of sin.